given an idea of what you could do beyond. And now the idea of having here uh, Sivan is uh, to go even deeper in that. I think she will uh, show many, wider. yeah, many, <laughs> yeah, wider. And to many applications, uh, how to start from uh, inexitonic wave functions and uh, to, to get something more. And let me also comment that Sivan did uh, the postdoc uh, in the, the group of Stephen Liu. Uh, in the group of Jeff Nick. Okay, very bad, sorry. <laughs> but working on the Berkeley GW code, so which is a competitor of the Yambo code. So she also brings somehow an alternative perspective. Uh, can you see that? <laughs> on the, let's say, on the, yeah, GW and BSC. So I think yeah, I have to stop the sharing here. Yeah, sorry. Okay, yeah, I mean, why did I stop the sharing? Sorry. Yep. That's what. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, may I borrow a slide adventure from somewhere? This one? Yeah. No, the other one. This one. Okay, so let me just bring my uh, ah, okay, so my connector. Yes? Ah, uh, yeah, maybe I saw it this one, okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, it's really nice to be here. Um, I'm Sivan. I'm from Israel, from the Weizmann Institute of Science. And like David said, I was uh, in Berkeley for a while as a postdoc, and before that I did my PhD also at the Weizmann, um, working with Leo Konik on DFT developments. Um, and these days, uh, with my own group at the Weizmann, we're mainly interested in excitons and extended systems and exciton dynamics. From various perspectives, and we're very keen about uh, complex structures and uh, how they relate to interesting parts of the exciton dynamics. And today I will try to give you an overview and relate things together. So I will be standing up here because I can't see the screen from there, but we'll play with that and we'll see how it goes. And I also do that. And I want to bring this. Okay. Brilliant. Mm. Let's see what happens. Okay, so um, the main connection, okay, remember I just told you that I'm going to go into complexities at the end. In order to go into complexities, I would like to um, go through with you the idea of understanding exciton processes using band structures. Okay, so we know that in band structure theory, there's a lot of information we can gain from understanding bands, from understanding the behavior of particles in the billion zone, so understanding k-point dependencies and so on. We just discussed that in the previous talks. And this idea is what I will try to follow, both from the electronic band structure perspective and then also from the excitonic and phononic band structure perspective. Okay, so this will be kind of the language I will try to um, 
put in front here and convince you that it may be useful. Okay, so um, this is how this talk will go. I will first discuss the basic concept of how we calculate optical excitations. Okay, um, brief overview because you heard quite a lot about it already today. And then I will go into exciton dispersion. And specifically, how can we use the concept of exciton band structure to understand how excitons depend on the crystal? Okay, the crystal shape, the crystal momentum as a translation of our crystal properties, symmetry, dimensionality. So this is already a translation between the uh, system, the structure of the system we have, and um, the excitonic uh, properties, which will lead eventually to the dynamics. Then in the third part, we'll talk a little bit about exciton scattering, specifically about exciton phonon interactions. Okay, we heard also a little bit about that today, so I will dive in a little bit into one of these perspectives that we're also using and show you some of what we are doing, okay, as example, and also some of what others are doing these days. And collecting all this information will then try to understand together maybe uh, if we can already describe something interesting about exciton dynamics. And when I say something interesting, I mean, for me, uh, that can relate structural effects with what is the time resolved phenomena, excitonic phenomena that is observed in experiment, okay? Because that will be in the end uh, our validation or uh, our connection, hopefully to reality. And when we try to connect to reality, then we would also like to introduce some complexity. Not just because actual materials can be complicated, right? Or maybe have to be described in more than just a simple unit cell. It's not just uh, a necessity. It's also because when there are complexities, there may be interesting dynamics involved. Okay, so in the last part of the talk, I will try to convince you with some very specific cases that this is sometimes interesting to look at. Okay. So, um, works sometimes. Try again. Giving up. Okay. Let's try with the, starting with the optical excitations. Okay, so I'm showing at the right um, the outcome, okay? And I'm going to discuss a lot to the materials today. So this is a transition metal decacogenide, a very well familiar one, one even selenide, uh, also similar to others. Um, and I'm showing here a band structure, and in fact, the gray part of the band structure is the uh, spin density, so we can you know, use DFT to calculate um, the band structure, to calculate the projections, to calculate the spinors, how they contribute to the bands, and these are things that you know already. And we can also look at the wave function, so what is shown here in the middle is um, in one of the wave functions associated with a specific K point. In this case, if I'm not mistaken, that will be the conduction band. Uh, and the orbitals around it, okay, great. We can look at them. And this is a lot of information that we can have. So just to briefly you know, connect that to things that we are talking about here, uh, this is a density function of theory calculation, right? So we use the Consham equations in order to uh, come up with these uh, um, properties. And then there's a whole field of what we can do with that, right? Because we talked, uh, uh, we use the exchange correlation functional, that's an approximation, and we can use local functionals, and in fact, to, for these systems, for other semiconductors we're interested in, this will give pretty good wave functions. That's already a lot. We have pretty good wave functions of electrons and holes. Think about it. That means we, cannot, we have already the probably most important ingredient in the excitonic picture. We just need to know now what to do with it. But okay, that's a very good first step. Um, the band gap and in general the energy levels are not well described and they should not be well described for these systems. There's interesting screening in this system. LDA, GGA screening is exponentially decaying. It just doesn't capture it. Okay, so this we know. We have a problem. We also kind of know how to solve it by now. Uh, importantly, David showed it in the last talk as well, excitons are not captured because of that. Non-local screening is crucial to capture excitons and exciton binding, and there is no non-local screening in local, in these kind of local DFT functionals. So we need to do something else to capture the excitonic picture. So we can use hybrid functionals. 
world of caches. I'm going to say that very generally and not discuss it. But many people use hybrid functionals in a DFT framework to calculate excitons. This may work, but not for the right reasons. In fact, excitons should be calculated, of course, within a TDDFT, time-dependent DFT framework. The fact is that many functionals have the wrong screening or approximated screening is not good enough for this kind of systems. So just by doing DFT, the energies are similar to the excitonic energies by accident. Okay, that's again a manifestation of the fact that non-local exchange is important. When it's not there, we get energies that can be uh, um, mimicking the excitonic effects without really calculating the excitonic effects. In order to really understand the exciton picture, the exciton wave function, and its time propagation as we're after, this will not be enough. And we really need to understand the excitonic uh, uh, complexity and how excitons look like. So hybrid functionals can be a very good step forward, but you have to know what you're doing. Right? To calculate excitons always during the linear response time dependent DFT. Then the electronic wave functions are often kept. There are many interesting cases where not, where the hybrid wave functions are different. And the local wave functions, good. These are nice cases to use hybrid functionals. It's not what I'm going to discuss today. There is additional exact exchange when we include hybrid functionals. So there are ways to tune this exact exchange to, be, to describe the systems well. And that's an interesting direction. In fact, that's what I've been doing in my PhD. And uh, it's still a very active field of tuned functionals. So there's a lot of you know, things we don't discuss here about how to do things properly with hybrid functionals. But what these tuned functionals are trying to do is to actually mimic the screening, the non-local screening. Once the non-local screening is well described, the excitonic picture can start to be assessed. We can do that uh, also with GW. Okay? And these days, you can do that pretty easily with GW. And that's a gift that I think you should use. Because why not? OK, so if we do a GW calculations, and I will tell you a little bit about uh, how we do that, because we heard about different methods. Um, in the end, when we look at the band structure, okay, remember our language today is a band structure. So the spin split can be modified through uh, including spin in the screening function. Typically, in these materials, not a big effect. The bigger effect is the opening of the gaps and the relative alignments between different bands at different K points. Remember, we discuss, we're going to discuss dynamics. Okay, so these alignments between how electrons and holes are in different uh, uh, moment, crystal momentum is actually crucial. Okay, so we would like to have a good description of that. And there was a discussion about the frequency, uh, frequency dependence and how to calculate this. This will be important. Okay, so we need to strive to use the best methods we have, uh, uh, but also sometimes we compromise a little bit when we know we can, to actually be able to calculate complicated systems. So this is the GW um, method. I'm not going to teach you this. You already studied it. Um, but it is within the Green's function uh, representation of a self-energy. We calculate a self-energy that takes into account a Hartree-like term and the screen exchange. Um, and within a Dyson uh, picture. But what I would like to mostly stress is how do we go from DFT to GW, because I don't know if that's so easy to understand what exactly is good enough from DFT, what is exactly that we're using. When we do GW, we have a specific DFT starting point. What does it mean? Uh, GW is already an approximation in the way we truncate the interaction in the self-energy form. Now it's also approximation in the way we include the DFT. I just told you that DFT is going to be very different with different functionals. So what does it mean about the GW we use? when we use different functionals as a starting point. This can be a complete mess, okay? It's not well-defined always. It can be well-defined, but once you start to use that as a user, you will find that you can get different answers if you use different approximations. That's because we use approximations. But we want to use approximations. We, in a way, have to use approximations, and it's a good thing because we learn things from it, but we need to do it wisely. So to do it wisely, we need to understand what is the effect of the way we describe the wave functions in what we eventually get. So for example here, okay, we calculate the um, polarizability. We calculate how electrons interact with other electrons and how holes interact with other holes before we put them into the excitonic picture, right? 
So we calculate this kind of uh, M. This is in the Berkeley GW language, but I'm pretty sure you uh, look at very similar matrix elements also in the YAMBO language. Okay, these matrix elements here will be uh, a block states interacting, but these block states are going to be calculated from um, DFT. Okay, so these are DFT wave functions. And these energies in the spectral representation of this uh, uh, um, polarizability will be, of this polarization function, will be the energy differences between DFT energies. We know already that they are not always exact. Well, they're not exact. Sometimes they're good enough. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that we uh, compromise a little bit when we go this direction and there are ways to improve it, but here I'm describing the RPA screening calculation. And okay, so we're going to use DFT wave functions and DFT energies as long as we know what we're doing. Okay, if we end up finding that we have a problem, maybe this is where the problem started. We need to know where to go back. But okay, that, that is probably good enough, also empirically. It's probably good enough for the materials that we're working on, good. Now we can go ahead and calculate the screening function almost trivially from having this polarization function with the Coulomb interaction, everything in G and Q, and you're familiar with the block representations, right? So everything is in crystal uh, uh, language. And then we correct the GW energies like we, we saw this week. The GW self-energy minus the DFT self-energy, which is the exchange correlation potential. An exchange correlation potential is a certain approximation for a self-energy, okay? So good, this we all seen, that's what we're doing. Well, the reason I'm standing here and giving all of it to you again is because I feel that for me it's very important to break the language of GW into step-by-step -step kind of process so that we know later on where to come back if we think we need to improve something. It is possible to improve the theory, and there's a lot going on here this week about this. It is also possible to improve the approximation. Okay, to be more appropriate for what you're trying to get. And it's not always similar, it really depends on what you're trying to get. And for example, in these materials, this is uh, uh, one paper uh, by the Louis group describing the this, uh, behavior of the dielectric function. Okay, so this will be the uh, two-dimensional dielectric function in real space. It is, look at it. I mean, it's hard to describe and it's hard to predict. And it was hard to predict before looking at actual calculations of the key dependence in the dielectric function to understand that will be such behavior. And we looked at it already. You remember all this uh, field, uh, I don't have it in the slide because I had enough, but all these kind of field lines, right, between the particles. This is the reason, because the short range interaction will be so different than the intermediate range will be so different than the long range that everything is complicated. And once we look at this picture, we can say, ah, yeah. Well, it's one in the short range because there's no screening. And it's one in the long range because there's no screening, because we go into the uh, vacuum, right? So the limits we understand. And in, in between, it has to peak, because there's a range where we feel the material very strongly, the screening of the 2D material. So of course, it has to behave like that. But good luck with predicting it without seeing it from an actual calculation that you trust. Okay, and that's the power of actually calculating screening. And even within a non-perfect approximation, and back then, believe me, it was not perfect. It is still not perfect, but it's getting better and better. But even at 2016, without subsampling, without really you know, looking at all the different aspects and the algorithms, you can have to have a perfect uh, um, a, a sampling of the grid. Still, we can learn something about the function, and in this paper, actually, also connect that to previous models and to understand why they are almost good enough at some limit, and other models will be better at another limit, and then you can combine analytical models and just get this picture. But how do you understand that without the ab initial understanding? Okay, so that's an example. But now we are here for excitons, so once we have these band structures and the understanding of the screening, we can use them to start to couple bands like we just uh, learned and to look at how this band coupling uh, uh, will form. So let's just have one slide on how we're doing that within the beta peter equation. Again, without the full theory behind it, you know it already, just to claim that we're looking at the exciton wave function and we are looking to solve the problem in the exciton basis set for now. So 
we define an, an exit on wave function okay, by a basis set spanning of pairs of electron and hole. See, they're here. Electron and hole wave functions. And these A's will be the basis set coefficients, the spanning coefficients of that. Good. Now, within a beta salpeter equation here in a Dyson form, we can calculate first the energy difference on the diagonal, the energy difference between electrons and holes. From GW, I didn't write here GW, do it however you find that is good for you. If you can compromise or choose, forget about the compromise, if you can choose an energy difference that will not be a GW energy difference, so be it. It is your choice. But have the way that works for you while you understand what's going on in the equation. So that will be the starting point. That will be what you're going to bind. If you underestimate it, and you can do that on purpose, just remember you did it. Okay? Because it means that your exciton energy will not be perfect, but perhaps the binding energy will be okay. Okay? Just know what you're doing. Then the second part is the coupling. The second part, we take free electron hole pairs. These are these VC, V prime, C prime, free electron hole pairs walking around. They're not bound. And we bind them together. Okay? Through what uh, is called here electron hole kernel, K to get, within this eigenvalues equation, the excitation energy associated with uh, this system. And all along this problem, uh, we have the eigenvectors. You can see already that the eigenvectors are the components that will build eventually the exciton wave function in this basis set. We just transfer to a different basis set. Okay, of course, it's almost trivial, right, when you look at it like that. I wrote GW energies, but you know now that you don't have to. So this electron hole kernel that, again, you already saw, but just very briefly, the way we usually truncate this, uh, it's a two-particle Green's function here. And the way we usually truncate here, we choose two terms, two leading terms in this expansion. One of them is direct. So electron, electron, electron goes to hole, hole goes to electron, you see, Feynman diagram. But what it basically tells you is that almost like a hard tree picture, you just have uh, uh, particles remain in their same uh, description, but just change their occupation, their band occupation. But on the other hand, we have the exchange term. Quantum mechanics particle can also switch, and we need to include both of them. When you look at it like that, it's almost Hartree Fock for excitons, right? You almost have the Hartree like term, the direct interaction, and you have the um, uh, Fock like right? It's not fork like term, but where you need to include the exchange interaction. And when we do both of them in this excitonic basis set, then uh, we get the coupling that we typically get within BSC. Okay? And there was a reference earlier today to the Many Body book of uh, Robert Van Leeuwen. Uh, there's an interesting discussion about that in this book. Uh, but also in these uh, papers as an example. And good. Voila, we have absorption spectra, right? So, you know, it takes some time to understand that this, here the subsampling is really important, so don't do that without doing the grid sampling properly. But once you know what you're doing, you can get an absorption spectra. Here it is. That's the excitonic picture we were looking for. We have the A and B peaks. How do I know these are the A and B peaks? I know because I'm not an experimentalist. I actually did that on the computer, and I can go back and see exactly where things came from. I know, for example, to put the bands, okay, this will be the conduction bands participating, and this will be the valence bands, and to look at the contributions at each one of the excitation. Where did it come from? You can also look at which K point it came from. You can do whatever you want with these excitons. You can break them to pieces and understand exactly their composition. So this exciton is coming from the higher valence band and the lower conduction. That's an APIC, okay, that's by definition. The second exciton is mainly by the second valence and the lower conduction. That's a B peak. If you know TMDs and you know the band structures that we're looking at, then you will also know what are the, the excitons. Let me just tell you that life is not always perfect. It's not just a band to band transition. There are more bands participating, sometimes more spins participating. Oof, sometimes momentum can participate. I haven't showed you yet, but we're going to include momentum soon. Then it starts to get messy. If you're doing exit on calculations, my own opinion is that it's your responsibility and it's your job to understand the mess. Because this is where things really start to be interesting. Okay? If you have an exciton that has both spin channels in it, oh man, this is not what they see in experiments, right? This is not what they see when they apply a magnetic field. 
Wonderful. Why? Why did it happen? What was the selection rule that was supposed to be kept and was broken once you introduced the ab initio wave functions? Because something happened. You go into the reducible representation of these excitations. This should not happen. It did. Good. Because the wave functions in these systems, okay, let's go back again. Because the wave functions in these systems are not really atomic wave functions. And sometimes if you represent something with a d orbital, that would be a very nice approximation. But you don't really need to because you have a representation of the ab initio calculated wave function. And sometimes it breaks the symmetry a little bit. And sometimes things will happen that you cannot expect. So I think it's nice to remember that while we all want to do a calculation and get an answer that we understand, yeah, that follows the theory we, we thought it should follow, and that's good. And that follows maybe also what we see in experiment, so we can understand it. But sometimes we see something more. The computer tells us. We put in the code, we put in the approximation, and we put in the ingredients, but we get some gift back, right? We get information that sometimes is unexpected. This is where ab initio is important. And you got this information, you may get scared, don't be. Okay, this is exactly why you went into all this effort of learning all this, because you learned something that cannot be understood without going into all this effort. And now it starts to become interesting. Okay, so let's talk about exciton dispersion. I talked about electronic band structure, now we can talk about excitonic band structure. I'm going to bomb you already with an actual one. Um, we typically expect excitons to behave um, nicely. There will be parabolas, right? dispersed in space. Why do we think about parabolas when we think about excitons? I don't know if you do, but why do I think about parabolas when I think about excitons? Because it would be nice to think about an exciton as a hydrogen atom, in some kind of a hydrogenic model. We would like to think about some valley where uh, the excitons, uh, are, the electrons and holes are close together, All right, some valley of valence and conduction. And when we go away from this valley, yeah, I mean, we go away from this valley smoothly. And that would be great because then we can think about a relatively simple approximation for the exciton and move on with that. Sometimes this is almost the case. Okay? So what we're looking at here is the exciton dispersion. We'll talk about it, how we get it in a second. Of the pentacin molecular crystal, I know it can be scary to listen to this uh, combination, but the pentacin molecular crystal is just a crystal composed out of molecules interacting with Van der Waals interactions between them. Very well ordered sometimes. They have nice symmetries and they have very molecular properties of the wave functions, but they also have interesting crystal effects. Let me convince you. Now in these systems, we would expect the excitons to be almost molecular. I'm going to take a risk and ask you a question. If the excitons will be completely molecular, what do you think will be the band structure of these excitons? They're very localized in the molecules. How would the band structure look like? What is the band structure? It's the exciton energy is a function of momentum, of exciton momentum. So suppose the exciton is very localized, if it was atomic. What would be the band structure of it? Would the band be very dispersed or very flat? Flat. Flat. Yeah. This is like a band structure of an atom, right? The band structure of a very small molecule. It will be flat. Why? Because it doesn't care about the crystal environment. Whatever momentum you give it, it will be the same. That's a flat band. The bands I show you here are the exciton bands for singlet states, and we'll soon talk also about triplet states. They are really almost flat, which tells us that it's almost a molecular picture, but they're not completely flat. They're not completely flat, so the singlet states have some parabolic shape. Let's see how we got it and then discuss it some more. Um, BSC equation, same as before, but now we have this large Q, this large Q is exciton momentum. Okay, how do we get exciton momentum? We go from an electron at one K point, this friend, to a hole at a different K point, and the momentum difference between these K points is this big Q, that's the definition of the exciton momentum. And uh, this will be for a specific exciton S with a specific momentum Q. And this is really just trivially expand the BSC equation to also have this electron momentum here, right? So the, uh, the electron in this representation has a finite momentum, the hole doesn't, and the difference between them is what we care about. 
Now we do that for each Q, for each exciton. Um, there was a question, I think, on Zoom before, if this is a di more difficult calculation than regular BSE. This is regular BSE. Okay, it's the same calculation, just different parameters. Okay, so you can do that. We can do that in Berkeley GW. Back then, that was the original paper where this implementation was introduced. Now things are also start to be interesting. Again, we have two terms in the, uh, uh, in the uh, kernel. We discussed it before, a direct term and an exchange term. And the exchange term actually behaves like, like uh, um, it goes like the Coulomb interaction. Let's stop for a second. I want to tell you something else about the best structure that we're looking at here. Okay. Should this be interesting in this system? Well, we may find, you see, that I calculate here these singlet states. And these singlet states have slightly different energies or different cues. We went through all this effort of learning and using, and some people, like Diana Chu here, of developing this code in Berkey GW, just to find that these are almost flat and pretty much parabolic. Okay. We could kind of get that from the structure. But when we calculate the triplets, we see that the triplets in this structure have opposite dispersion. I'm not going to go into um, multi-exciton generation now. There was a question about bi-excitons before. We actually calculated bi-excitons for these systems to evaluate the, what is called singlet fission mechanism. Singlet fission is a transition between a singlet state that is optically excited. It will be this S bright here, the D decaying directly into two triplet states, you may see that their energy is pretty much half of the singlet energy, so that can be energetically allowed. This property of the opposite dispersion tells us a lot about the interaction, the intermolecular interaction that leads to these uh, triplet states, and this actually results in direct Coulomb coupling between singlet states and bi-triplets. So already from this bench structure, I can tell you that we have learned a lot. We, we, developed it and we formulated it and we calculated it, but already from this picture I can tell you that you can see these interactions between single exciton and bi excitons. Only from looking at the band structure. Okay? You shouldn't be able to just see it from looking at it, I'm just telling you it's just that paper here below. But we can oh, yeah, we can skip another step now and go a little bit into the future. Let's look closer. Let's focus on these singlet states, but now we look at very small momentum. Okay, and uh, Julio presented this already in this morning, and I'm very thankful for that. That was a good preparation. Uh, when we go to very small uh, Q, we see uh, the exchange behavior depends on the details of the crystal, and I would mainly like to convince you right now that they depend on the dimensionality on the, of the crystal. Pretty simple considerations. This is the behavior of the Coulomb interaction and in turn of the uh, exchange term in the kernel at different dimensions when Q goes to zero. That will be the analytical limit of this behavior. And already from these considerations, you see that there will be interesting things going on. So let's start with concentrating on the, what we see here. This is a 3D material. It's a bulk material. And this theta here, we should expect some theta dependencies. What is theta? Theta is the direction, is the angle between the polarization direction, the light polarization, where the light is shining, to the excitation direction, to where the preferred excitation will be in the crystal. And excitons in these systems are not the same in different directions. These are pi systems stacked, Van der Waals stacking, and the stacking direction going, is going to determine a lot about the intermolecular interaction. Let's hold for a second. This is a crystal effect. You will never see that from a single molecule perspective, from taking two molecules. This is really something to think of. There will be interactions here between the molecular crystals, between the molecules in the crystal. It will be anisotropic, so it will be dimensionality effect. And maybe we can learn from the way they interact how the system is built. I'm plotting it here. It's not that easy to understand in experiment what is exactly the phase we're at, how exactly the molecules are oriented, Okay, good, now we have all this information. Let's go back. What do we see here? We see a split, and this split is just because the excitation at the X direction is much stronger than the excitation at the Y direction in this system. Are you standing because, um, no? Okay, I got scared for a second because we didn't touch dynamics yet. <laughs> um, what does it mean? 
Okay, even if we don't touch dynamics. For me today, this is the essence. Okay, that's the most important ingredient. Because now we have a connection. Okay, we see an actual uh, effect of the crystal structure. Right, it comes from the way the molecules interact in the crystal, but we can assign that to exchange, and we can assign that to the behavior of the exciton energy at very small momentum. Um, this is what we call longitudinal transfer split uh, of the excitons, and indeed it's very similar in spirits to the longitudinal transfer split in phonons. Okay, so that's an example. Why does it happen only to one exciton? It happens to the bright exciton and not to the dark. If you're familiar a little bit with excitons, you may already know the answer. Bright excitons come together with uh, large exchange interactions. Okay, it comes together with large electron hole coupling, so there's a strong exchange interaction between them. This loud exchange interaction is also manifested in this behavior. Dark excitons are very small exchange, so we don't see the split. It's very, very tiny. Okay, it should be there from these considerations, but the exchange is small, so the split will be small. Okay, so how can we connect that to something that can actually be observed? We will look at it soon. Another system, uh, which will, I will just fly through, uh, is again transition method decocogenized, and in this case, it's molydisulfide. And like what uh, was discussed before, in this case, there are two uh, degenerate at zero Q bands, but not in other Qs, uh, parabolic and linear bands, another manifestation of the dimensionality effect. Okay? Now, I should stop for a minute and try not to confuse you too much to tell you that this property is in this basis set that we calculate. In the actual excitation, uh, it will be much relaxed. Okay, the interaction with the light field, for example, uh, will relax this property. But still, when we want to look into dynamics, we don't only look at interactions with light. We also want to understand the fundamental excitonic properties that will dominate dynamics. So that is a fundamental property. Okay, but to observe it may be complicated. Okay, so from here we keep in mind exciton dispersion, exciton band structures. Things can be less trivial than what we would expect. But this is where they become interesting, right? I did not show you yet that they become interesting, but hopefully soon I'll be able to convince you. Let's go to scattering now. Why? Because I want to touch how these exciton band structures and how these exciton properties are related to time result uh, uh, phenomena. So we need to look into time, what happens at long times, but we know that in all these systems, once we let time in, we have to take into account exciton scattering, and one of the main mechanisms will be the exciton scattering with phonons, right? So how do we do that? There are different ways. I don't think any of them is perfect yet, but I'm going to take you through one of them briefly. Okay, so for example, if we think about these diagrams of these electrons and holes, you can think about phonon interaction between the electrons in the excitonic basis set, right? So we have coupled electron hole pairs, but the electrons can interact through phonons. That's a very specific diagram. Okay, in a recent paper by Antonius and Louis, and also, uh, you know, this, this follows work from 2008 by, by uh, Marini here. There are others. Okay, I'm just showing here a specific example because I like the diagrammatic form that they came up with. And that's a paper about a self-energy understanding of the exciton phonon interactions. And yeah, for me it's helpful. Maybe it will also be for you. So now we look at the kernel of the exciton phonon interactions and we ask ourselves what is this self-energy for the exciton phonon. And there are some possibilities with their names. We talked about the Van Dahl term first. So these will be these electrons and holes interacting separately but within an excitonic picture. And there will be other terms like exciton phonon exchange terms and uh, interesting terms if you want to look at localizations that we're not going to discuss today. This is just to promote a little bit that now there's literature to go in and, and, and learn about this. And I think you will learn more about it tomorrow, about the separate variables. Let me just say that this we can calculate. You can calculate and it will be easy for you. You will learn how and then you will use something like density functional perturbation theory and voila. You now have all the ingredients. Okay, you should be so happy. Really, it's wonderful. Really, I was not that lucky. Um, and I'm really happy for you that you have this possibility. But now how do you do that? 
what would be the right way to put things together. Not this. This is just the first example to show how to go the direction of the right way. It will be right for some things, right? But we want to be, in the end, as exact as we can. So let's start. Let's start with these two terms. What do we do if we want to account for these two terms in the BSE equation? Simple, okay, this is just, uh, let's couple the two excitons here, S and S prime, with one term that will take into account the electron-phonon -electron, electron coupling, and one term that will take into account the whole phonon coupling. It looks like many terms. It is really not that much of an issue to put these terms together. If you can Python, you can do it with the ingredients you get from a BSE and some DFPT calculation. But it's slightly more complicated than that because you need to know what are your parameters here, what are you counting for. And note that we have both large Q and small Q here, and that's because the exciton dispersion and the phonon dispersion are both important. Okay, that would be the phonon dispersion of pentacin that you can calculate for any material that you want, basically. So that would be the phonon dispersion for the uh, uh, system. The electron phonon coupling can be calculated on top of that. Good, you have this and you have this. It needs to be coupled to the excitons, and it needs to be coupled to the excitons with different momentum. Because why not? There is no reason it should be coupled only to zero momentum excitons. The only reason is that we used to think about excitons as optical excitations, and then they have zero momentum. That's it. That's not the physics of scattering. If you want to include scattering mechanisms, you have to be careful about the way you include the momentum. Even if it's flat, it needs to be there. Okay? Otherwise, you just exclude many important parts of the interaction. And then, behold, I'm showing a rate. We'll talk about rates. But we talked also before about the fact that we can gather this information into a Fermi's golden rule. What is a Fermi's golden rule? It's a way to calculate lifetimes or inverse rates. Uh, from summing all these coupling terms that we just discussed, we came up with coupling terms, good. Now we have matrix elements to tell us what are the coupling between the uh, particles. And the occupation, don't be scared about these ends. This just tell you if the uh, phonons are going to be occupied in the temperature that you choose. And the energy conservation between the uh, transition energy between the two excitons and the phonon. So if the phonon can create this transition, good, V. Okay? It is written as a delta function. We always expand it. It will never be a delta function. First, because numerically, it's a nightmare. And second, because it's never really a delta function, we know that the energy conservation should be, uh, we should give it some broadening. So we usually put Gaussians or Laurentians uh, to take into account this broadening. It is really simple, OK? Sometimes you will hear that people tell you that these kind of things are complicated. It's because it was complicated for us sometimes. For you, it is really simple, OK? This is where you start. This is what we get when we do something like that for the pentacin crystal. And let me just take you a little bit into what's going on here. Remember I showed you this split? Well, I'm actually cheating a little bit with the title, my bad, but I'm comparing tetracin to pentacin here. Okay, so pentacin is in the right, and there's another crystal very similar, where the molecules are four rings instead of five, and that will be tetracin. I'm showing also tetracin because in the tetracin case, the split of the bright band is below the dark band. So we have a well-ordered a set of dark states and bright states. Well, in pentacin, the, the energies mix because of that. So what we end up having in pentacin is intersection. Okay, we have intersection of the excited states of the dark and the bright states. You can already see it here. But if you look at it as a function of the angle, you see it also in different angles. And these matrix elements is a little bit of a show off. Okay, it's just to show that we can calculate them. This is just what I just showed you. For the uh, uh, lifetimes, this is one over the rates that we just looked at, between the bright excitons here at different cues, look how smooth they are and relatively quick to decay in tetracin, and look how the picture gets more complicated in pentacin because of this mixing. And we, also, we can also look at the uh, transitions between the bright to dark, okay, that will have a certain structure, and let's not go into it now, but they will have a certain structure we could never predict a priori. Uh, uh, that we know from these calculations and a different structure from pentacin. The important thing is that the lifetimes are much longer 
then the intraband transition, so we can look at intraband scattering and interband scattering and how it's related um, to the specific phonons that dominate the scattering and so on. There's a lot of information. Again, this is a complicated picture. Now your job, break it to pieces, understand where things are coming from. This is what we're here for. These kind of things were also done, for example, uh, by others. So, for example, this is uh, 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 from Davide and Marco Bernardi in this group. Uh, we looked at it also before for HBN. And just to show that this is very similar, these are lifetimes, same method, okay, lifetimes uh, uh, calculated with the exciton band structure and also the terms uh, for the different momenta uh, for different states that will show us where, is the pla where are the places where uh, the exciton momentum, the excitons are strong, where are the, where are the brilliance on places where the exciton momentum will dominate the interaction. Again, take momentum into account. And as a follow up, I would like to stress that. In my own opinion, if you want to look at exciton photoluminescence, exciton emission, this kind of scattering is something that you really need to think of very carefully. Okay, so this is uh, from a paper we looked at also earlier today by Julio, uh, and uh, this kind of uh, um, analysis was, uh, is done now by more and more people, which I think is very nice. Can we look at the emission spectra now or the photoluminescence? But it is a little bit more, I think, that the comparison between absorption and emission than just the selection rules of the excitation and the decay to different momenta. Look, it will include already some decay to different momentum, right? But how? Time plays a role now in emission. Absorption can be thought of in, as a linear response, right? But emission cannot be. Emission is a scattering process. So you have to take into account when time becomes an issue, phonons become an issue, temperature becomes an issue, Temperature-dependent emission is a very interesting set of information you can look at. The broadening of the emission peaks also give you an estimation of the scattering uh, and as, can, as also calculated here and so on. So there are many things to take into account when you start to think about time result processes. And the emission, for me at least, is one of them. Okay? Before we even touch dynamics, this is already dynamics, emission. And there are, of course, many other properties that will include scattering. We reached exit on dynamics. Uh, David, can you tell me something about the time? So there are five more minutes, and then there will be a second half of the time. Okay. So let's, uh, that's good. Let's go through exit on uh, diffusion. We talked about emission, about emission. Now we talk a little bit about diffusion. This is from a nice review paper by Naomi Ginsberg, uh, which I like a lot because I would like to understand the experimental perspective. And Naomi is an experimentalist looking into exciton diffusion, doing this kind of experiments, <coughs> as well as others these days. And uh, we looked at it also before. There's a, a kind of an exciton excitation. Let's call it a wave packet. And now it uh, propagates in time, and they can look at the broadening of it, and really by really looking at it. I mean, this is very, very interesting. Uh, 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 time result photoluminescence. And briefly, they look at the change in the broadening and assign that uh, to diffusion coefficients, and from that they can look at the diffusion mechanism. Is it normal diffusion, or is it special diffusion? Is it ballistic? Uh, is scattering plays a role? multi exciton generation? What not? How do we describe this from theory, ideally from real-time propagation methods? I'm not going to go into that, of course. You heard that this morning. You are working on the code that I think masters this, and this is wonderful. Keep doing that, because one day, we would like to describe these things with time resolved uh, properties. This is kind of to touch TDGW. Um, TDGW is a way to build excitonic picture. Is it a way to look at exciton dynamics? Complicated. Discussed before a little bit exciton phonon interactions within this picture. It is going these directions for the scattering. In my mind, I would think that excitonic dynamics should be captured in TDBSE. But again, it depends. How exactly, how are we going to do that? How do we include exciton scattering? It's more complicated than just what will be the right method. And let's discuss this complexity a little bit. Okay, so that's one way, which we're not going to touch today. How do they think about it from experiment? In experiment, they usually talk about these excitons within a kinetic equation kind of picture. Okay, so we thought that we can calculate rates. So for example, we can think about some diffusion uh, coefficient Within this kinetic equation, what is n? n is the exciton uh, density, right? And the exciton density will change uh, uh, the function of this coefficient and also a decay that is related to the scattering lifetime, which how 
Nice it will be to think about the exciton diffusion this way, but that means that the excitons should be very, very stable. If things are in the exciton basis set and remain in the exciton basis set for a very long time and other things don't happen. Maybe sometimes it's the case, maybe for some times uh, this is the case. From the theory perspective, I would really recommend following the work of uh, Mikhail Glasov from Ayafe Institute, where he looks into these kind of terms in a more ordered fashion. This is a wonderful paper, I think, about exit and phonon interaction for a, from a Green's function perspective, but semi-classically. Newtonian, okay, the excitons are bosons, they propagate. If that would be the case, what will happen? This will be the theory. I'm not showing you the details, but note, this is not the same Q. This is right here for exit on phonon. It will be taken into account as well as a bunch of lifetimes associated with that. If you want to see how this looks like analytically, go to Misha's papers. But it's not just about how do excitons diffuse. It's also about do excitons diffuse. I mean, is this always the case that we can look at it as Newtonian or uh, boson particles that just go along the material? When should we be a bit more careful about that? Okay, so I may take a little bit of the lunch time, of the questions time. Um, but if we go back to the exciton dispersion that we talked about uh, earlier for transition metal decacogenides, let's think about this problem now. We have bands. What is diffusion? Mm, Boltzmann. Diffusion is the relation between band velocity and the scattering lifetime or the collision lifetime of the particle. So if we know how much time it will take the exciton to meet some other particle, phonons, and we know it's band velocity. Maybe we can say something about the way it propagates. Good. Let's think about it in the semi-classical picture and build a, a wave packet, a theoretical wave packet on top of it. Let's, that would be this wave packet. And let's propagate it. Good. We propagate it on the parabolic band. At 150 femtoseconds, nothing happens. Why? Because it's very flat. Nothing really happens. It doesn't go anywhere. Great. That would be exactly the picture we want. We can go much further with that, from that because we know here phonons will come into place or they start to be scattering. But in the ballistic regime, OK. On the linear band, woof. Oh, no. What happens? That, is, that, that makes sense, right? There's a, a non-analytical term at the Q with the wave packet just goes away from it. This looks very surprising at first. But there are papers showing that this ring forming is actually a property of exciton propagation in 2D materials. But it's hard to say that this predicts this property because that's the very short lifetime. In these papers, the theory for this uh, uh, ring forming will be coming from exciton phonon scattering that actually induces where the light excitation is, very rapid multi-exciton generation. So the assumption is that the excitons just go away, maybe. But we also see that this can be seen at very, as just the starting point of the propagation just from the band shape. Is this real? Is this true? Please join the party. We want to understand. Um, but we can, OK, assign that to some band velocity, some diffusion coefficient. We can put that into a rate equation. Do we want to do that? Probably not in our case. Because this representation of this rate equation is nice to understand things, but we think that very quickly things will go out of this boson basis set, out of this exciton basis set. And we cannot really describe it this way anymore. So how should we describe it? Good question. And in the very last part, I will show you some cases for why it may be interesting to describe it properly. And I will not answer the question how. If we meet again in a few years, I hope we can discuss more about that. This is an open question. And my personal opinion is just it's a very interesting one. And I think you people. Uh, can be uh, the ones who actually give answers. Where can it be interesting? Three examples, promise. First of them is defects. OK, people can now go very precisely into creating defects, for example, in TMDs, and uh, shine light on them and see what happens. And this is the emission picture. I can just tell you that there will be defect states here and non-defect states. And the defect states will live for longer time than expected. They should recombine very quickly. They don't. And there will be interesting exciton dynamics and scattering associated with that. There was a question here before about magnetic properties of excitons. This is not a magnetic system, but let me tell you something about that. When we calculate excitons in molybdenum sulfide with and without, without and with defects, okay, 
So we can, for example, we can look at the exiton picture and the transitions dominating it. We'll not go into that. I'll just tell you that there are transitions between very flat defects. Remember, we discussed it before, that the dispersion of very localized bands is very flat. That's what happens with defects. But it is mixed with non-defect bands, so we have this wonderful mixing of flat and dispersed bands. This creates very special excitons. And when we calculate the G factors of these excitons from BSC, if you know what it is, good. If not, we can talk about it later. But it's basically a measure of the magnetic response of these excitons, the response they have under a magnetic field that can be observed in experiment and is observed in experiment. And we see that while for the non-defect state everything is simple, there are A and B peaks with magnetic response that is pretty much what's observed in experiment, and people did that, introduce one vacancy, one calcogen vacancy, and this is what you get all over the place. The magnetic response is everywhere, and that happens because all the properties that dominate the spin uh, selection walls here break, and they break wonderfully in a very complex way, depending on all the possible exciton transitions. The average of that will become zero, and this corresponds nicely to our collaborators in Munich who measure zero G factors for this kind of defect. But, you know, this is just one group, and we can discuss if this is really true or not. But this is an outcome of the exciton complexity. So there was a question before, how can I look at a single exciton from BSE? Do not. Why should you? I mean, do if you want. But this is, you can, you can use BSE to capture all this wonderful complexity. So then you can only look at one exciton. This one is pretty simple. It's this one. Yeah, one bend to another. But look what also happened. So why should you exclude these effects? They're very interesting. Can we describe this in simple dynamics? No. The spin scattering and the valley scattering is going to be crazy. And the decoherences associated with the valleys will break. So we better look at this very carefully. This will be strong interactions. OK, in the exciton scattering. Second example, I will not dwell a lot into. I will just tell you that TMD heterostructures are another interesting case. We have a recent paper on that uh, uh, with a group of Tony Hines, where they will basically show that there will be momentum effects uh, this was discussed before by Davide. There may be transitions of excitons with direct momentum to excitons with indirect momentum in emission. They can measure now interlayer excitons in this kind of structure and look at their energies and their temperature dependencies at absorption versus emission with, you know, some, I think, pretty good uh, uh, proof that there will be these momentum transitions involved in emission. Okay, experiments can go very, very, very um, deeply and exactly now into what is observed energetically, and that's wonderful. By the way, they also say in absorption, the two spin channels in this case. Not only one spin channel, which means that only having a heterostructure, heterostructures breaks the spin selection what we talked about before, and there are no dark and bright excitons. The excitons become bright just because of the symmetry effect. Okay. And the last thing I wanted to, uh, to show is the case of strong exciton lattice coupling. Okay, that's another type of coherences that may occur. And this is for the case of perovskites. And perovskites are very interesting systems with very interesting structures. And they have been shown uh, by many people that they can hold self-trapped excitons. What are self-trapped excitons? Excitons that really don't want to diffuse. Why? Because lattice because strong interactions with the atoms. This is very interesting with the assumption that exciton polarons are actually the main particles there and not just uh, uh, independent excitons. And this is a very nice paper, paper uh, from the Chernikov group in uh, uh, Dresden where they showed that this, uh, uh, at some uh, uh, limits of the interaction, uh, looking at this terms of photoluminescence, you actually get what they call negative diffusion or no diffusion, okay, which really cannot be explained by, by the, the theories that we know. And this, I think, is kind of a nice uh, way to think of how can this be explained. It definitely has to go beyond this picture, but think about you know, even the phonon description here is problematic. It's collective. It's not localized. OK, so how are we going to do that? How are we going to take that into account? Okay, this is for us, and this is for you to think of, but trying to convince you that the applications are interesting, the observations are interesting, and the theory is, is interesting, and the combination between everything is really interesting. So that's the summary. Uh, you have the ability to compute many things now. 
Uh, you have the large scale computing really accessible. You have exit and phonon scattering pretty much ready at certain level. Uh, exit on properties from BSC, exit on dispersion. You have a lot of information about DFT. Once you learn that, you can even you know, skip some steps. Use DFT if you think it's more appropriate. It will be system dependent. It's for you to understand and to choose. But eventually, you can use all this to have some starting point of the exitonic picture to start to understand what should be the dynamics. And if this should be the dynamics, how should we describe it from a theory perspective? OK, so this is yours. And uh, uh, you can choose it if you want. I would like, just like to acknowledge uh, the people who are involved in some of the results that I showed you here. Happy to take questions, and uh, thank you. So thank you very much, Sivan. And uh, so let me stress what Sivan said. So there are very many useful applications which you can try to tackle with the BSC and beyond BSC. Of course, here you are in a school where first you want to learn a BSC, but then there is also plenty of room for developing and improving the theory. And so, I mean, if you will learn DFT, then you will be, you could be the one who will go beyond the present knowledge. It would be great. And so, I would have uh, many questions, but first I would like to let the students to to do them. There are some in the chat here. Okay, yeah, maybe I can try to with a, let's say, simple one. So you have uh, discussed. They were from the audience. Okay. Yep. Okay. <laughs> okay. So yeah. So. Tom Sayer, yeah, you can try to unmute yourself and make the question. Someone put the view. Hello, Sivan. Me again. Um, I like the picture at the end. That's good. Thank you. It was a very challenging talk. Um, so this MOS2 dispersion, where you have this sort of linear and parabolic band, this is calculated around the gamma point, right? And like point. you said, you have an optical excitation it starts it off, it necessarily has Q equals zero, and then there can be phonon scattering to give it finite Q momentum. But in MOS2, you also have this band nesting effect, right, where there are these sort of parallel linear dispersion bands near gamma, but away from it, where optical excitation then leads to spontaneous dissociation of electron and hole in K space, one to the left, one to the right. And in my mind, that that almost conserves momentum. So do you know about that? Does it need, um, does it need phonons to do that? And, and would the dispersion of the exciton band be negative in that case? Would it lower the energy to gain finite Q? And what does that mean? Yeah, these are great questions. I mean, what I'm showing here is really the dispersion that you naively get by using the method I showed. Um, what you're asking is about what will be the exit on dispersion upon more or less trivial electron dispersion. How they, will this be combined? I can tell you that this is not very far from what you get when you have defects in, different types of them. We also have very, uh, you have additional channels that will also be inserted into the exit on dispersion and into the exit on phonon scattering. I can tell you that we're working on that. In this case, even the numerical steps are not trivial. You enter a supercell picture that you have to treat very, very carefully with momentum. That will be my tip for now. But I agree with you that this is a very non-trivial and interesting case uh, to look at. Um, I don't have an intuition. I, I don't have a you know, result or slide for what will happen. I can tell you some of the intuition that I will have. Uh, but <laughs> I don't know if I should. From the defect case, my intuition will be that, similarly to the case of different excitons, you will also have different interactions with phonons. And this will be, you just have an ensemble picture, right, of things uh, interacting together. So that's a many-body picture of different states, in this case of different bands, different excitonic bands, different electronic bands, and different phonons. Have a well-defined method, and you will see the effect together. But the mixing will be the key. OK, so there. Well, uh, I'm glad you're trying to solve this because I don't know. 
<laughs> for a very certain <laughs> case, right? That's another issue that I may raise, that this is a difficult structure. What about finding methods to calculate these difficult structures in other, in other methods? Like, you know, you guys and girls probably like machine learning. That would be one way to think about how to come up with the effect of these kind of complicated structures, but then build it into this picture from the wave function properties. There are many ways to go in this direction. I, I'm not saying that these are easy calculations, they're not. Uh, the difficult, the, these days, the defect calculation that we did for the excitons took us uh, two years allocation on Insight, which is the stronger GPU computer in the US right now. But it's doable, and it will be easier when, you know, probably next year already. Okay, so we have another question from Burak Ozdemir. If you can unmute yourself and pose the question. Yes, uh, <clears throat> actually, I wrote it in the chat because uh, I was curious whether it is possible to calculate exit on lifetime uh, with external electric field applied, whether it is possible. Magnetic or electric? Electric. Yes, I mean, yeah, well, DFT, you probably have it in Amber, right? I mean, you can easily compute the effect of electric field on a... Uh, on DFT bands and uh, wave functions these days. Now you can think about how to put that into the excitonic picture. Not trivial, it's not just a wave function effect, it should also affect the interaction. So go back to the derivation, go back to the screening and think about what would the electric field effect. I will think about it as a dipole effect. And I agree that it's very interesting and I think maybe people already do it, it should be doable. What for me is more interesting is then, okay, think about that, then you create dipoles how will they affect the excitonic picture? You will have this information from the electron hole coupling. How will this affect exciton dynamics? You may also have this information. Okay, so I, I think this is, this is indeed an interesting property of excitons. Okay, thank you. So, and then we have uh, another question from Yadong Wei, if you can unmute yourself. Okay, otherwise I will read the, the question. Is it possible to calculate phonon-assisted photoluminescence via exciton phonon coupling? It is very desirable and starts to be possible at certain level of approximations, and that's an example. Um, it is, uh, I would say, very much um, wanted by many. And this will be, this will be an example. Uh, the Bernardi paper here also has photoluminescence in it. Uh, this is one way to go. The two other ways are presented here at the left part of the slide. Um, so very happily, the answer is yes. I think it's, it, I couldn't give that answer not too long ago, but due to very interesting work by groups here and also in other places, now the answer is yes. Now, now the question should be, is it, can it be done in a way that will describe the interactions we want to describe? For these kind of systems that are described here, this is the proper way. For other systems with other type of excitons, there may be other ways and so on. So, any question from the audience here? Okay, Fulvio. So first of all, thank you for the amazing presentation. And I just have a technical question about the calculation of the axon phonomatics element. And uh, we have seen in the expression that you need uh, basically both um, a grid in uh, electron momentum and some grids in uh, transfer momenta. And the question is, do you compute this matrix element in the irreducible part of the Bilouin zone grids and then to get, for example, Q plus small Q or K plus Q, you apply some symmetry rotations, or you compute everything without symmetry in the full Bilouin zones, both in transfer momentum and momentum? So we're kind of a brute force kind of group. We compute everything because we don't really trust ourselves to know how priori what will be important. But I think it is definitely can be folded into the properties you're describing if you know what you're looking at and if you come up with the right symmetries for the system. 
it should be doable. In some cases, I would say maybe be careful about that, especially if, uh, if the extended picture actually captures some of the symmetry breaking. That would be important. So you don't want to go back to the reducible uh, uh, symmetry, but uh, to the reducible symmetry. But I think in this case that I, I showed for the pentasin crystal, um, it, it can be done. In fact, we have some recent work with uh, Felipe Jonada at Stanford where we did something like that to understand ex uh, multi exciton generation from tight binding picture. We took here in the unit cell, we only have uh, two molecules per cell. Uh, and still that's kind of a super cell. So you can think about how can this be described in a unit cell picture, what will be the appropriate symmetries. And only from this, you can understand what will be the band structure of the electrons, the excitons, and then the multi-exciton generation that I discussed before. That will be, I think, going into the direction that you're suggesting to use you know, the ab initio understanding to now reduce the level of complexity and solve the problem. I will vote for that for sure if you don't lose information about the complexity. Yeah. Okay, so I think now it's really time we, we go for lunch. We thank Sivan again. Thank you. So before we...